Welcome to In the Envelope, a podcast from Backstage, the number one resource for actors and talent seekers. I am your host, Jack Smart, awards editor at Backstage, and I'm here to guide you through every aspect of the entertainment industry with the help of some of your favorite stars. These intimate, inspirational conversations with today's most award-worthy film, television, and theater artists provide you, dear listener, advice on how to live the creative life, personal stories of success and failure alike, and maybe, just maybe, a tantalizing glimpse in the envelope. thinking about the whole story and how to tell the story in the best way and what the different beats are of the character's development through that story and that that's all like stuff that you're doing consciously but then once you're playing the scenes once the camera's rolling it all goes completely out the window Welcome, listeners, to another episode of In the Envelope. I am your host, Jack. I am here, of course, as always, to provide a window into an artistic process, some inspiration around uh, how to fulfill your ambitions as an artist. Listen, I think today's guest, uh, Alessandro Nivola, really speaks to that exact topic of the question of ambition. How should it look? How high should you aim? And most importantly, I think for a career in the arts, as we know on this podcast, a career in the arts is very unpredictable. Keep adjusting that ambition and keep changing the dream, changing the goalposts. And ideally, that means dreaming bigger and bigger. I would say, Alessandro, just looking at his career, for those who maybe are not as familiar with him, he is kind of one of those actors where you are familiar with him. You just don't necessarily know his name. He is what's known as a character actor. I really appreciated his breakdown of, of what that means, character actor. And he's kind of transformed, you know, morphed into a bunch of different roles, very different from himself, as he says, but is now in his first leading role as Dickie Moltisanti in the new Warner Brothers movie, The Many Saints of Newark, out in theaters now, and a sequel, uh, sorry, prequel film to The Sopranos. Uh, those of you Sopranos fans out there, Alessandro Nivola gives a fabulous performance in this movie opposite just quite the cast of Ray Liotta, Vera Farmiga, John Bernthal, the list goes on and on. Anyway, this is the kind of inspiring interview that we love here on this podcast and, of course, at Backstage because Alessandro kind of breaks down, again, how to go from stage to screen, how to keep adjusting your, your dream, carving that path through the industry, through hard work and a commitment to the craft. And, of course, we got some very juicy, very fun technical looks at Alessandro's process. But elsewhere Backstage, a lot of big, exciting things happening over Backstage. It's an exciting time of year. Keep an eye out uh, for those print subscribers listening for Backstage's annual College Guide. Looking at it here, we have fabulous interviews featuring uh, students returning to college amid COVID, a feature on courses you can take that enhance like an actor's uh, special skills, like on their resume. And then, of course, we have cover star Martha Plimpton of the new film Mass. Um, and on the site, we have interview features on a bunch of buzzy, maybe even awardsy projects. Tis the season, listeners. Uh, I know it's only October. Uh, welcome to October. Welcome to fall. And welcome, for our purposes, to award season. Uh, we have features on the site uh, from talent from Saturday Night Live, The L Word, Dear Evan Hansen, Q Force, Blue Bayou. Head over to Backstage.com to check all that out. But um, let's take a quick break and then get to this fabulous interview with Alessandro. Thank you so much, sir, for joining us. You are one of those actors where I truly cannot wait to see what you do next. Hey, if you are an actor or an aspiring actor, someone at the beginning of your artistic career, and you haven't signed up for Backstage yet and you don't know how it works, I have good news for you. Backstage is offering 30 whole days completely free just for our In The Envelope listeners. If you visit backstage.com slash subscribe and enter the code envelope, you will have full access to the site where you can make a profile, upload a headshot, upload a reel, start applying to the thousands of casting notices uploaded every single day on the world's number one casting platform. Again, we are giving listeners of this podcast 30 days completely free to try out Backstage. Go to checkout, that's backstage.com slash subscribe, and enter the code envelope. 
If you want to be in contention for an Emmy or for an Oscar or for a Tony or for a SAG Award, do as many of the guests on this podcast have suggested and use Backstage. We are here for you. Again, free 30-day trial, backstage.com slash subscribe. Enter the code ENVELOPE. Alessandro Nivola fulfilled his dreams of a stage career before scoring his Hollywood breakout in Face Off and appearing in Junebug, The Wizard of Lies, Disobedience, and many more character actor roles. Tony nominated for Broadway's The Elephant Man and a SAG winner for American Hustle, he's also produced Doll and M and the award-winning To Dust, and now stars as Dickie Moltisanti in Warner Brothers' new Soprano sequel, The Many Saints of Newark. Here is the talented Alessandro Nivola. How are you today? You're, is this a day of press? Uh, it's turned out to be that way. It wasn't uh, originally kind of one of oh. the dunkit days, but but things have have been added, and it's it's proving to be a. Uh, a long one that ends with the cold bear show tonight, and then oh, okay, that's almost the 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 end of the of the line for me. <laughs> right, it's sort of an interesting point in the pandemic of of there are certainly in person events again, but it is not the level of it is not a traditional press rollout, right? Well, we didn't like fly to England, for example, which yeah. um was kind of a disappointment to me because I. Uh, I've, I've so much of my career has um, emerged out of there, and I'm married sure. to an English girl, and uh, you know I've lived there for periods of time, and and uh, and then the movie seems to have gone down so well over there that mm-hmm. I really wish I could have been there, but but it was not to be. But I on that that okay. said, I I couldn't believe that we had a real premiere, and there it was at the at the Beacon and the. There we were on the red carpet and Robert De Niro <laughs> introducing the movie and everything. Oh, wow. It was it was pretty. Uh, it felt a little bit like the old days. We had a. I then had a party in my room uh, at the hotel where we were doing the junket that night. With it was mainly just my family and a couple of friends, but we had all been, you know, tested and whatnot. And so we did our best uh, Led Zeppelin circa 1974 <laughs> invitation. And, uh, and then I was woken up two hours after I went to bed at about, uh, at about seven 30 in the morning by the hotel telling me that my toilet oh. was overflowing into Michael Gandolfini's bedroom, which was no way. Right, right underneath my, the hotel. And I had to pack the whole place up. It was just a disaster <laughs> and, and move to another, another room. <laughs> Wait, this does sound like a return to normal. <laughs> yeah, normal the, closest, the closest thing we've had. I, I was so grateful to, to have yeah. gotten no sleep just for the feeling that <laughs> I was alive again. You're living life. Yeah, exactly. <sighs> the things we miss. Yeah. Well, congratulations on this movie. I mean, I, I think it's a really interesting one to talk about. So we are backstage. We are the actress trade publication and you've spoken to backstage before. Did you ever, um, do you ever use backstage for casting notices? Uh, God, I, I, you know, the thing is that when I was, uh, I, I ended up having an agent when I was very young. I, I, I was, uh, I started acting in theater pretty young and, uh, in a, in a very old fashioned kind of way where I was, um, doing, internships and summer theater kind of backstage wow. kind of work and then and then getting little parts and kind of regional theater productions and then and by the time I was a sophomore at Yale uh, where I went as an undergrad I um, managed to talk this agent into representing me and I was going back and forth to New York for auditions on uh, during the weeks uh, when I had free time and so I, I really uh, I, I didn't have that experience of arriving in New York and just sort of mm-hmm. trying to uh, get everything started there. So I didn't. But Backstage was, I think, the first magazine that I've ever been on the cover of. So oh, cool. I, I'm very, <laughs> um, it, it has a, <laughs> a big place in my heart. That's great. I, I think it was um, it was not long after I started at Backstage that you were on that cover. And, and 
I then saw the it was pegged to the elephant man, which was so amazing. Yeah, and, yeah. it was like it was. Uh, I did a, a bunch of press for that. And I think that was like the only picture that was sort of somewhat passable when I, given that I had this huge damn mustache that was like <laughs> this like big Victorian walrus thing. And uh, I was like, the, I remember it was like the first time I was like, you know, getting all these pictures taken and being in magazines and stuff. And just every time it, would, it came out, <laughs> it was just unusable. I couldn't, uh, my all my reps were just like had their heads in their hands. This is not what he looks like. <laughs> well, that's actually great to hear. It's it's cool to hear like the editorial side of things as the as the person in the magazine side of things. That's always nice that your first cover is it's not a small thing. Um, no, no, it was a, it was a, it was a very big thing. I yeah, mean, that 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 play and everything was a um, you know one of the kind of highlights of my career. I feel and I, certainly. Uh, and certainly one of like the I would say the turning points like I'm it's it's good hearing you talk about the, your early career because and of course we love asking about early career you know advice but looking at your resume it does seem like Face Off was this you know pretty big project and it was your first film like is that the the biggest equivalent to a big break has it been a series of smallish big breaks um yeah i mean the thing about face off was that i i don't think i really realized what a big deal it was at the time Uh and i really um missed the opportunity to take advantage of it in in a kind of business savvy way i um right after getting cast in that right after that you know i finished filming that i was uh, offered this role in a Michael Winterbottom movie called I Want You that was one of 12 other movies that I've starred in that have never been released. And oh, uh, <laughs> and this thing, uh, you know, was starring me and Rachel Weisz and uh, it was uh, a kind of weird thriller that was set in the south coast of England and he had asked me to play this fisherman from Hastings who'd been in Brixton prison for eight years and was coming back to find his old love or whatever. And, and I, um, I I went over there and I just got all kind of caught up in in that and then and then being in England and I was being offered roles over there and stuff and my my and Face Off came out in America at that time and I didn't even fly back for the premiere mm. and I remember like my agents calling me up and like Etta James was singing in the background and it was like this huge event there and them saying like, Hey man, we wish you were here, you know? And I was like, Oh yeah, you know, I hope you're having fun or whatever. And I I just didn't really like, I don't know. I I didn't understand that like this was a moment to take advantage of it all. I was just kind of excited that I was working and in this new adventure in a new country. And, and, uh, and I sort of assumed I just had no understanding of the press and media and and sure. how to use that to your advantage. I just thought like if you're good in stuff that that it will lead to other things and, and well sure that's actually that's good to hear like it's all about the craft for you but yeah, well you- no I mean I, it, it, shortly after that I, I realized what a mistake it was and how <laughs> important it, it, it was and I was full of regrets about not having um, been savvier about all that. But is the is the theater background? I mean, is it safe to say that because your early days were also first and foremost in theater, that that also maybe made the transition? Do we think of it as tra- a transition to screen maybe challenging? Um, well, I, I guess the thing is that my ambitions were all about the theater, and I mm-hmm. uh, I grew up uh, fantasizing about being. In plays, I saw an interview, one of my, you know, with all this press that's been out now around many saints of Newark, I've had people from my childhood and stuff get in touch and people who've seen interviews or whatever and say, hey, you know, how you doing? And that somebody sent me um, uh, a an interview I did in my high school newspaper uh, talking about, you know, the plays that I was doing in high school and and what my kind of career ambitions were and all that kind of stuff. And, and uh, everything I was saying was, I mean, it was so kind of modest, <laughs> my ambitions. They were they were saying, I was saying, you know, I just really, uh, my goal is to 
be hired enough in the theater that I don't have to uh, hold have another hold down another job in order to make ends meet. And sure. as long as I can do that, I'll be happy. And I'm not even like asking for some sort of huge success. But I, you know, I guess if I if I don't have to work another job, I'll consider that a big success. And I just want to be, you know, it would be amazing to be on Broadway, all that kind of stuff. So I, I wasn't talking about movies at all in this thing. And it was, I think, pretty revealing in a lot of ways because I, uh, I realized how, well, I mean, you could see it in one way as being kind of, you know, touchingly noble aspirations. And on the other hand, it's like hopelessly uh, unambitious. And, mm. um, and I uh, and so really that that was a it is an accurate representation of how I was feeling at that time, which right. was just wanting to be on stage and wanting to be on stage in New York. And and then a year out of uh, Yale, I, I was I cast my very first role in New York. And this is I'd already been doing some regional I'd done quite a, a you know a handful of of big roles in regional plays over the summers while I was in college, so I had some I had real professional experience, but I, I hadn't ever worked in New York. And my very first job there, a year out of college, was starring opposite Helen Mirren in a Broadway play of a uh, Turgenev's A Month in the Country, and. So suddenly, like there, you know, my my lifelong ambition had been kind of realized, uh, only a year out of college. Um, but very quickly after that, all of like my peers who were also uh, in the same, but making their Broadway debuts, and they were guys who've all become kind of movie stars now: Jude Law and Damian Lewis and uh, Rufus Sewell and Robert Sean Leonard and. Um, Billy Crudup and uh, Ruth, uh, yeah. Anyway, they they were um, they they all were kind of uh, skipping off to Hollywood uh, uh, on the backs of of these um, eye catching performances that they were giving on stage, and mm-hmm. and that uh, you know obviously has been a, a traditional launch pad for movie actors and. Uh, Marlon Brando and Paul Newman and all those guys went that route, but and I, I just hadn't really conceived of it that way as a stepping stone mm-hmm. uh, until I saw all those guys uh, go off into the glamour of Hollywood, and and then I got really jealous and uh. and uh, wondering why I wasn't being asked to do the same, and and then soon enough I was, but it, it wasn't immediate. It was. It, it took a while. Some uh, Mindy Marin, who was a casting director who'd seen me in that play, mm-hmm. had been wanting to cast me in something, and and she was casting Face Off. But it wasn't until I think a year after I'd done that play that that I was cast in Face Off. And then I didn't do another play uh, for like eight years or something. So it, everything just completely shifted overnight to to Los Angeles and mm-hmm. London and and movies. Um, yeah, it's a testament to how success, maybe how you define success and certainly where you set the maybe the goalposts of ambition, like cannot be set in stone. The industry will make it so that that is impossible to just have the one goal and try to stick. Yeah. You have to constantly change the dream, right? Well, of course, when you know, when you get the thing that you've just longed for and craved so much, then yeah. it, it, it's uh, o- almost overnight that <laughs> that suddenly you want something else. That's just the human <laughs> condition. And it's pretty uh, miserable state. Uh, and it, it, there's 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 really no way around it. Um, and it's part of kind of staying alive is just always kind of having, you know, having new cravings and goals and, and yeah. longings and it's just it's it, i guess that there is something one, one has to, to to battle those feelings on some level and try and feel grateful for what you have and i mean i i this has been true of most of my career i've i've been you know trying to feel grateful for for the the, the career that I'd been having and for the, the, the opportunities that I'd had and for the work that I'd done, even as I was sort of feeling uh, resentful that um, I, I didn't have more. And um, mm-hmm. but certainly uh, looking back, I, 
I feel that maybe I'd undersold myself um, in the early days and, and that I just was, uh, 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 I, uh, maybe I was too humble about it. <laughs> sure, regret, maybe regret is inevitable. And so is this idea of like, you're so spot on, but it's just a very human thing to get what you want and then immediately want something else or something more. I mean, there's even a line in the movie, I think Ray Liotta says, uh, you know, it's about the wanting, you know, you, you, uh, yes. you know, uh, oh, you're always wanting things, you know, that's, that's, I, you know, that's where the pain is. Or so I can't remember exactly how he says it, but, uh, you know, David Chase even, even threw, threw a little philosophy in there for us. Absolutely. <laughs> Ray Liotta is so good in this movie. It's, it's amazing. Like I, and I, I don't know how spoilery we want to get in this interview, but there's like a slight twist with the Ray, with Ray Liotta's role. And um, yeah, I uh, mean, they've mentioned that in, in uh, like reviews and stuff. So I, yeah. I mean, it's a great little uh, trick for, uh, that the movie provides, but I mean, the problem with my role in this movie is that almost everything I do is a spoiler. And so sure. Like, yeah. trying to, like I've been going on these talk shows and things and they've been trying to pull clips to use for the, uh, for the talk show segments and like the available clips is just nothing because all yeah. of my dramatic scenes involve like some huge like plot <laughs> plot turning event sense. and and uh so it, it's been hard to talk about or or you know show footage from where i'm involved just because of that but but i yeah i don't know i don't know about the the ray thing but i i figure screw it we can i'm sure yeah we can talk about well and ray liotta and you mentioned de niro I, I always love asking like what were the or are the acting inspirations do you have like we don't want to pick favorites, but do you, did you have actors growing up that you were like, I would love that person's career or I'm really connecting with what they're doing on screen or stage? Yeah. Well, so, I mean, as I was saying in the beginning, I, I really wasn't, um, I, 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 you know, I didn't have a lot of film heroes. I wasn't a cin cinema file cinephile. I wasn't, um, you know, so a lot of my heroes were like, I don't know, great stage actors. And I remember, you know, I was always hearing these kind of seasoned Broadway pros talking about, uh, you know, Colleen Dewhurst and, and Jason Robards and, and all these guys. And I'd never really seen them on stage. I just, those were the kind of uh, mythological names that were sort of George C. Scott. And, yeah. um, and then of course there were all the English ones, you yeah. know, Gail Good and, and, uh, Richard Burton and, and uh, Lawrence Olivier and everything. And, uh, but then as I started to progress and, and started to get excited about movies, uh, all of that changed. And I, I really, it, my, my, all my heroes became the um, kind of movie star character actors of the 70s wow. and 80s. Um, uh, you know, that was the era when, the whole notion of what a movie star could be had had started to change, and there were these guys like Dustin Hoffman and and Robert De Niro and and Pacino and Gene Hackman and Robert Duvall and uh, you know who were uh, playing misfit characters who were odd and flawed and uh, not traditionally romantic and. Um, but who were commanding the central focus of the story and sure. um and some of the best movies of the time of the era were focused on those kinds of characters and so that was that was kind of who i wanted to be and um sure. and face off being my first movie really set me on that trajectory insofar as that i kind of laid down the the um marker for being able to play roles that were very unlike myself and and uh that i could um kind of morph myself pretty easily and it was i always found there's something about my face uh, uh, that changes really dramatically with very small little things like my, like my mustache hair. Well, yeah, I mean, my, that's no, I mean, it's funny, but it is one example like that or my mm -hmm. hair or little, little, very subtle things like 
just I, I just look really different. I, I don't know what it is. It's just I just have a face that that uh, can become kind of unrecognizable easily. And mm-hmm. um, and I, whether or not how aware of that I was, I don't know. But I, I was excited by the idea of mm-hmm. of um, you know changing myself into into somebody kind of unrecognizable, and it made me feel safe and free and le- less self-conscious. So, um, so yeah, that was, but, but, um, that said, I, I really, um, hadn't found a, a way to, um, also, uh, take the, the center stage in, 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 in the way that those actors had very young. Um, and it, it took, it was a kind of long, slow process for me to kind of uh, have the desire and the the instinct to um, uh, take that space for myself. Sure. Well, and and you may have just answered this, but I was going to ask, like, what is your definition? How do you define a character actor? And also, is there a difference between a lead and a supporting role? Do you approach every role the same? The term character actor um, has two meanings. Uh, on the one hand, it means uh, an actor who plays characters, meaning people that are unlike himself gotcha. or themselves. Um, uh, on the other hand, it, it has a kind of connotation of being a supporting act. And... Um, you know, when you refer to people being character actors, you usually mean the guys who show up and kind of enhance the the fabric of a movie without drawing too much focus away from the central character. And there are, are great people, um, great actors throughout history who have uh, done that brilliantly, but... Um, a lot of whom you kind of know their faces and you don't know their names. And that's, that's, I guess, what people traditionally associate with that expression. I mean, I like to think of it more in the first definition of, of somebody who uh, um, can, you know, is uh, very different from one role to another, but that doesn't preclude their, star quality or their um you know their ability to to hold a show uh, hold a film on their shoulders Hmm. um and this movie i i mean interestingly like the the times that i've been offered the opportunity to be the lead in movies um often they weren't that well written and uh, and the, the the role wasn't as characterful as the one in this movie, for example. Characterful, and they yeah. didn't, it didn't it uh, didn't it didn't afford me the the opportunity to really f- find behavior and vocal things and mm. physical things that that uh, were really specific and unique to to one person who was not me and. Hmm. Uh, and this one did while still being, uh, you know, the guy that the story is really about. And um, so it was that's, I think, why this for me, apart from it being in a movie that was going to be anticipated because of the popularity of the series and, and because it was like a big studio thing that was going to have a lot of advertising and all that. Apart from all that, it, the, this was such a, an opportunity for me because I felt like it was going to allow me to do the things that I do best um, in, in, in the lead role. Sure. Yeah. Well, um, speaking of like things you do best, cause we're all, I want to ask, we love asking about process, but sometimes process is a hard to talk about or b a secret, <laughs> but you're, is it safe to say like your process comes from the training that your, your training has mostly been on the job, right? Uh, no, I mean, I, I, I really, I started out going to summer drama schools and things since I was very young, I, you know, in like fourth, fifth grade. 
my mom, I, I had asked my mom to, if I could do that. And she found, um, you know, different programs depending on where we were living at the time for me to go to. And they were, they were real acting schools. Um, gotcha. not, not just like summer stock musical theater type things. They were, they were teaching, you know, uh, um, Meisner and uh, Stanislavski and Uta Hagen and uh, all that stuff. I was reading all those books very young and, cool. and um, taking acting classes uh, where I was doing scene study and all that kind of thing pretty young. And then uh, even into college, I was over the summers, I, I, I did a summer at Oxford where the head of the Yale Drama School was teaching um, summer acting course there. And I did a whole program with him. And mm -hmm. he was a, a kind of guru for the Yale Drama School named Earl Gister, who taught a very particular technique that he, uh, what he called playing in action, which he defined as um, how you want to make the other person in the scene feel oh cool uh, as opposed to like what do you want uh he just had a different way of of framing it where you, your active uh need in the scene is to make the other person feel a certain way and it and that all was uh, just one of many things that, sure. that but it was it, it was kind of i liked that because it it took the focus off of yourself and, mm. and helped you not be so self-conscious because you were so concentrated on trying to make the other person feel a certain way, whether it was, you know, feel loved or feel intimidated or feel, you know, feel small or feel weak or make them feel, uh, you know, powerful and strong or, or make them feel uncertain or, you know, there's an, obviously a million different mm ways but it just puts all the focus onto the other person in the scene anyway these are just these are just things and now but but ultimately once once i really got going and it kind of emerged out of the time that i was studying and doing classwork like that i i wouldn't say that i had that i came away from it all with uh you know a particular yeah. uh technique or method that i go about i mean i, I it's been different on on every job how i've how i've gone how i've worked on it all of those different tools come back maybe not necessarily planned it just depends on the role the direction certainly this idea of like the co-star depends on what you're i love the idea I, I mean those acting tricks about are just ways to think about acting like make it about what the scene partner wants or what you want them to feel that's fascinating yeah, and this so guy was an amazing. I mean, he was a, a really amazing teacher. He he had um, he'd had a tracheotomy, and so he had this voice uh, electronic voice box like Sanford Meisner that mm. he would hold up to his throat when he wanted to talk, and he would um, often say really emotional things about a scene. And he taught he taught everything was taught through Chekhov through the Chekhov plays, and so oh. uh, like I remember him talking about. Masha and Vershinin's final scene in, in uh, the Three Sisters when yeah. he leaves her and you know and he's <laughs> he's saying like um, this is the last time you will ever see him. How does that make you feel? Do you understand the importance of this moment? And he's got like tears <laughs> tears in his eyes, you know. <laughs> And uh, and but his voice was just in this kind of electronic sound, wow. like a computer. And um, anyway, he was a really compelling character, and uh, definitely had a big uh, impact on on my um, you know on my life at that time. That's really cool to hear. And and I it's I want to get to and this is maybe where we can really dig into Dicky Moltisani, like your relationship with your characters and how how you. Do we think of it as getting in and out of character? Like, what was it like on set for you? I really want to ask about judging characters. Yeah. Particularly in this case. Is yeah. it the actor's job to, to consider the character's morality and to make judgments? You know, how do you reconcile you versus somebody like this? Um, yeah, I mean, I... Uh, let's just 
start with like apart from being an actor uh the older i get the less judgmental uh cool. i feel i'm becoming just mm. because i've made so many mistakes and and been so hopeless at times in my own life that i um i feel just endlessly forgiving of of everyone uh even um you know even people who do really you know terrible things i think uh, you know it's there's not that much separating those people from me and um uh, obviously like i i don't consider myself a murderer uh and the idea of like killing somebody seems really hard to to imagine for myself but uh, on the other mm -hmm. hand like the idea of doing something in like a fit of anger that is irrevocable and that i can't ever get back uh you know is is something that i completely can identify with and cool. and uh whether it doesn't have to even be physical you know it could be uh, abusive in other ways and i and i you know i just feel like anyway i feel i feel um not superior in that way and, right. I, and i definitely and so then uh, when it comes to um characters uh no, I definitely think, I mean, I think, uh, I think art in general shouldn't have, um, uh, you know, shouldn't be, be like proselytizing some kind of morality anyway. Yeah. I, mean, I think, I think, uh, stories sh should pose moral problems. Um, but, uh, ideally they shouldn't be, um, preaching some kind of, uh yeah. some kind of answer i um so but the relationship between the character and the audience is uh you know in terms of artifice in terms of storytelling and how to engage an audience and everything is a it, it is a more complicated question and um hmm. and there are characters who do terrible things that um maintain their relationship with an audience to the end of a story and then there are characters who don't mm -hmm. and i definitely feel that it's important as much as possible to maintain that relationship with the audience even okay. even uh if you're playing somebody who um is uh you know, violent or, um, you know, does, does horrible things in the story. And, yeah. um, ideally you have the, the writer trying to preserve that relationship, um, uh, okay. and trying to allow bad people to, to, um, be understood at least, or, or to be, uh, you know, to have an audience feel for them. Um, but, um, sometimes it requires the actor to try and inject that, that gray, gray area into yeah. the, into the performance to try and, and keep that bond going between the audience. Yeah. Well, and like you said earlier, very frankly, um, not every actor is given the best material every time. And sometimes <laughs> <laughs> you are having to do the legwork of, I'm fascinated by this idea of developing a relationship with the audience because that inherently means that you do have to have a perception or a judgment perhaps of your character. And you have to even know how they literally look on camera, for example, in any given moment. Yeah, I mean, I think, it, well, okay, let's, let's get down to, just talking about this character because otherwise I, I'm going to be, it's, I'm just sure. going to start to like spout like philosophical crap that doesn't really <laughs> sure. mean anything. But I, uh, you know, to use this guy as an example, I mean, yeah. I, like I, you can't do things that are much worse than what I do in the movie. Um, and I kept, uh, so I, I, I definitely was thinking about it in terms of like, well, this guy is this, he's an anti-hero of, of some kind. Um, but if you think about the great anti-heroes in, in stories, you feel, you know, by the end of the thing that even though 
you don't necessarily love them you care about them or or you feel like that their that their downfall is has some kind of tragic sense to it mm. even if you you don't love them and so in the case of this uh ob- the the uh, most obvious example that i had to go on was was uh de niro as jake lamada and raging bull which to me became you know once i became a, a film lover I, I it's really mm-hmm. i think one of the greatest movies of all time and i think his performance in that i personally rate as the best ever film performance oh cool and um which you know i mean it's pointless to sort of make those kinds of lists and everything, but i but I, I that's how i feel and I, um, so I had already watched that movie a million times. It was one of my dad's favorite movies when I was a kid. And I, I first saw it when I was, I don't know, 10 years old or something mm. in the theaters. And, and I, and then I was, as I was getting ready for this movie, I watched it a million times. And, um, I kept thinking to myself, well, this guy just like, God, he does all these terrible things. He, you know, he's just cruel to his brother. He's, he, mm. you know, beats up his wives. He, uh, is, is unfaithful to them. He's, um, you know, just he, he, by the end, he's like slept with an underage girl. He's, I mean, just, you know, he's a, he's the deplorable guy in, in so many ways. And yet you get to the end of the movie and it just like, it makes you kind of want to cry. Like when he's there, uh, you know, by the, by the end, fat and, in, in these little clubs kind of quoting on the waterfront and everything. And I could have been a contender and everything. And you're just thinking like, well, why, like, why do we stay invested in this guy? And, and so I just started going scene by scene and trying to figure out like, well, what is he doing in each of these scenes that like uh, keeps that relationship? And it, it really seemed to me that, the crucial scene was when he finally is arrested for that. Yeah. For, for having sex with that girl, that underage girl. And he finds himself in like solitary confinement in prison. And it's like dark and he's alone in the cell and he just like kind of unravels there and he starts punching the this, this like cement wall with his bare hands and he just starts crying and he's saying, um, I, you're so stupid. You're so stupid. You're so stupid. And I, I just remember thinking, well, the, the thing about it is that he wants to die and he hates himself as much as, or more than the audience does. Uh-huh. And uh, yeah, at that moment. And, and because of that, you, I don't know if forgive him is the right word, but you just, you just feel for him. Yeah. And so in this movie, I, I felt that, and I think that, that David, I mean, we didn't really talk in too much detail about this, but my impression was, and, and I did talk to Alan about it, was that, um, that, that, that this character felt that way by the end of the story. And that's the reason that he doesn't want to see Tony hmm. by the end of the movie is that he's so full of self-loathing and, and self-disgust that he uh, feels that a- anything he touch, anything he touches uh, is defiled. And, um, and, and so he, the guy that he loves more than anything in the world, who is Tony, uh, he, he feels like he has to sort of cut out of his life in order to save the boy. And, and that whole idea is just so kind of heartbreaking to me and just get across that feeling that this guy wanted to obliterate himself, uh, you know, as much as or more than the audience did. And, yeah. you know, that was that that's kind of you know, what and I you felt. as an actor have to know that like you were you were designing that moment. Yeah, there was a conscious decision to yeah. to try and and get across that that feeling of of self-loathing to the point where totally it goes beyond where you know where it really is believable that that uh this guy's suffering uh 
so much. I mean, the ultimate, you know, to, to want to kill yourself is kind of the most that you can suffer, I guess. Right. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can't really suffer more than wanting to die. And, um, and so, um, and so like his suffering has to, I, you know, somehow mirror the, the, you know, the, the way that he's, you know, the things that he's done to other people, um, in order for it to have any, any legitimacy or value. Is that exercise about getting your co-star, getting your scene partner to feel something, is that something you're doing to the audience? Um, well, okay. I, I say all this, this is like, you know, talking about like the architecture of a performance. Cause there is like an intellectual side to the whole thing and, and, you yes. know, plan, planning it out in a way uh, and yeah. that, that happens kind of before you're in there um, that you're, you're thinking about the whole story and how to tell the story in the best way and what the different beats are of the character's development through that story. And that, that's all like stuff that you're doing consciously. But then once you're, once you're playing the scenes, once the camera's rolling and you're filming, like uh, it, it all goes completely out the window and you're just, it, it, none of it matters anymore. Um, you, you're just, um, trying to be as uh, alive and spontaneous mm -hmm. and present as you can and and to not think about anything. So um, they're two totally, diff in, in, in my experience, they're two totally different things that happen. One is about kind of preparation and the other is performance. And performance mm -hmm. has like ideally no intellectual um, gotcha. element to it at all. It's so cool to hear. I, I mean, I was just speak speaking with somebody about this, the idea of like, head versus heart and yeah preparation versus then spontaneity on the day it seems like so much of an actor's job contradicts each other <laughs> it's your job as an actor to not see them as contradictions yeah i mean obviously uh there are those two sides to it that you've described one which is um kind of trying to shape and control uh, a narrative and the other is just like total uh, abandoning uh, uh, control and surrender. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that you're for, I'm, by the way, I just think you're really successful in doing that in this movie where like I can see it's very, it's very cool to see you thinking as this character. And yet <laughs> it feels like you are absolutely in the moment, especially with these like, I guess, abrupt moments of violence where like that seems as, as spontaneous and organic as possible. Yeah. Well, I think one of the things that's appealing about the character is his, is that he's kind of, he, well, he's very unsophisticated. Per, he's a very unsophisticated person. And this takes place at a time uh, before psychoanalysis really <laughs> had developed and, and, uh, the the idea of kind uh, of being able to grapple with your own emotional and psychological well being or whatever is just completely like didn't exist. It, it's a it was not even totally. uh, introduced as a notion to someone like this. And right, um, especially for men. Yeah, exactly. I mean, yeah. guys of in this from this background and yes. part of the world and everything. And 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 so to see somebody who has no tools uh, to to understand himself and, and to understand the impact of like childhood trauma or whatever, trying to understand those things and come to like a dawning awareness of uh, the way that he is the, the architect of his own destruction and that everything ah. that, that, that he does is his own fault. And, and that it's because of things that he can't control about his own nature or whatever. I mean, that those are, uh, that's a fascinating thing. And so part of that required me to, uh, you know, really f find a way to play him where he, he, he's almost like, I mean, where he's emotionally and, and, and kind of psychologically stupid. Um, yeah, I mean, sure. that sounds like a judging way of putting it. I don't mean it that yeah. way, but, but I mean like infantile or like innocent in that way like and that he's not um that that he has a kind of um 
that you know he's a little bit like slow on the uptake when it comes to you know and, and Ray's character in there is the opposite. I mean he's yeah. just like highly highly intelligent uh, it, it, both emotionally and psychologically because he's developed that over the court. Maybe he was just like that, or maybe it's something developed from this uh, extreme experience of being imprisoned for that long and and grappling with what what he'd done and everything. So like uh, those scenes to me are kind of the most fascinating scenes in the movie because yeah. you've got this this kind of sage like person and then this kind of idiot who is uh, who's trying you know who's being given all of this wisdom and just uh, can't understand how to to under how to how to take it on and to to have it affect his life in a positive way. Yeah, and again, I think that's that's the relatable part. Like we can relate to. Um, that's why you really just tied it back to the idea of judging your characters, because we, as audience members, whether or not we can relate to specific actions they're doing, we can relate to their flaws in ways that make us uncomfortable. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. That's uh, that. The more so, the better. Totally. Um, I have to let you go soon, and I haven't asked about auditions. We love asking about auditions. Yeah. Do you um, have a philosophy about auditions and how to approach them? And like, what is your number one piece of acting advice, especially for the early career working actor? Um, well, I, you know, I've talked about this in the past, but it, it's a, it's been a, a real impediment in the, in my career. I, uh, I think I was maybe pretty good at it when I was very young, just starting out. Um, but uh, it, I, I hit a point where I, I just got so full of anxiety about it. And part of it was just because I had this feeling that I had done enough work that I shouldn't have to put myself through this torture anymore and, mm-hmm. and debasement and, and uh, feeling of being treated disrespectfully and everything. And um, I kind of got obsessed with that. And I, I, at a certain point, I just stopped doing it altogether. Mm-hmm. And I told my agents that I didn't want to audition anymore and I would only take meetings or whatever. And mm-hmm. and they were like, not that psyched about it for obvious reasons. <laughs> um, but I, and as a result, like there was a, a, a kind of eight year period where uh, I, I was getting work based on the fact that I already had an established film career and stuff, but I wasn't a star really. And so mm-hmm. I wasn't just being offered a million things. I was being offered second tier stuff. And, um, and it wasn't until the, the, um, dawn of the self tape, which I started, uh, 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 adopting for myself very early before you could, there were before iPhones and all that kind of thing. I had like a, a really old kind of Sony handy cam that I started, taping myself on these little HD cassettes and then through complicated wiring and stuff, I would hook it up to my computer and find a way to, to send these things out. And, um, and it really, uh, turned my, my life around. Um, and, um, so, uh, and, and, you know, I'd say most of my biggest roles of the last 10 years, I've gotten that way. So cool. um, okay. And I, uh, so I think that's a, that's been a great thing for me. Um, I, I would say, however, in general that like, and, and probably it's going to be more and more of that self taping and everything because of the fact that, uh, you know, since COVID everybody has just sort of moved so much online and stuff, but, but I, I, I would say that uh, the attitude, if I, if I could do it over again, I, I wouldn't have, have bowed out of auditioning in person the way that I had. And I just would have like changed my attitude about it and um, just uh, accepted that it never, it never ends through a career uh, having to prove yourself and, and that there's no shame in that. Um, and um and that, and then the other thing I'd say is, I, I, you know, in more recent years, that, that I've really thought about auditions as um, uh, uh, an opportunity to explore and discover a character. And um, obviously, sometimes you have no time, but I, I, that's one thing that I've really sort of begged for is, is more time. Often, mm-hmm. when things have come in. And, and usually uh, when they say they need it the next day, they don't really need it the next day. (laughs) And if you can get it in like in a week or a few days or, uh, you know, however long that, 
uh, you know, they're, they're not going to not look at it if, uh, if it's good. And, um, uh, obviously it's harder when you're just starting out because sometimes you're sending things in and they just don't have, you don't, you know, you may not have a, an agent that is powerful enough to kind of make sure that it's kind of shoved in front of the casting director's face and all that. And so I, I, I take, uh, it for granted that, that, uh, that can be hard, but I, 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 but certainly I feel like now I, I try and buy as much time as I can gotcha. and then I just completely invest in it. I don't, uh, I don't try and protect myself from the disappointment anymore, uh, which I think at times would make me like not prepare as much as I could have because I just was like, well, I'm, you know, what are the chances I'm going to get this? And then I will have like, fallen in love with this character and then it's gone, you know, and I can't have it. Wow. But I, and so I've just accepted that that's possible, but that I, I, I'm just going to do it for its own sake and, and uh, pre- almost pretend that I have the role and that I'm, that I'm starting my research and preparation for it. I always now memorize it uh backwards and forwards i never i never just like read it off the page i know that there are times where i felt like oh maybe i'll seem like i don't know i i don't want to sort of dress up and do everything as if i'm like in the movie because it's going to seem mm. like embarrassing to to the people watching it and and so i obviously i don't like overdo it on costumes and things like that but i but i do try and suggest something with the way i dress and the way that i do my hair or whatever it is that you know about the character um and i I keep a pretty like neutral background but i don't do it in front of a sort of paper pulled down like i just make it like a wall that it's in in, you know in my own house and it's a it's a particular place it's not like a sort of studio looking thing and sure and then I um, I really take time with it, and um, I, I really prepare. I uh, on this thing uh, I had to shoot a lot of my big dramatic scenes. I had to tape a lot of my biggest dramatic scenes, and wow, yeah. And I spent two weeks working on it. I I I hadn't watched The Sopranos ever mm-hmm. before it, and I wa- I watched the whole first season in the two weeks I was getting ready, and I watched. Oh, I watched Raging Bull again. And I watched Goodfellas again. I just like I kind of just cleared my slate for a couple of weeks and just really worked on it. I mean, this was a particular thing because it was such a huge opportunity. I, I knew, yeah. and they don't. I, you know, I didn't. I don't. I hadn't been given that chance so many times. So I really. Right. Wanted to. But then, um, and I yeah, I memorized it, and uh, I did act, act dialect work on my own, and, cool. and I really sort of. Um, treated it like I was starting my my preparation for the role. So cool. I think there's some really, that was really excellent advice, especially for early career actors. Um, I think they can't hear, we all can't hear enough this idea of like invest fully, even if you're going to get your heart broken yeah. and work those muscles. Cause... Yeah, unfortunately it's painful, <laughs> but that, you know, if, you, if you're not willing to kind of, you know, just like, give yourself over to it that way yeah. and then and then you know be willing to sort of suffer the the humiliation of of rejection and it's just like uh do something else i guess but it, it that's Absolutely. not to say that it's that it's not hard and i've had a long you know career of of you know facing that kind of rejection and, and it's really really hard absolutely. so i'm i'm not pretend i'm not trying to be a uh, glib about it you know? no absolutely that was really, I think listeners are going to get a lot out of this, this really good, great acting career and craft advice. So thank you, Alexandra. <laughs> well, thank you. Really good to talk to you. So good to talk to you and congratulations on this film. It's 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 the culmination of, of a lot of work. And thank you for kind of illuminating that for us. Thanks so much. Thanks a lot. I'll talk to you again soon. Envelope is recorded at Lotus Productions and Hyperbolic Audio in New York City and Soundbox LA, Mark Rouse Studios, and Buzzies in Los Angeles. 
Thanks as always to our producer extraordinaire, Jamie Muffet, and to the team at Backstage, Samantha Sherlock, Mark Stinson, Caitlin Watkins, and of course, Casey Howe. Visit Backstage.com, and don't forget, you can subscribe to Backstage by using the code ENVELOPE at checkout for a free trial. That's right, 100% free. For more exclusive content, join us on Facebook and Twitter at In The Envelope, and subscribe, share, and leave a comment. Who would you like us to interview next? Thanks for tuning in. We'll see you next time for another glimpse in The Envelope.